my back. Um, figured I'd just break them up, different stories, so the video's not long. Uh, let's see, next story to go off. Uh, military, okay, so I just came to Japan in the military. Mm. Oh, so they checked me into a, a decommissioning squadron. So basically it's a squadron that's because they've been around for so long they're they're getting rid of it. So for whatever reason they sent me to a squadron that that they were firing and like moving everybody out of. So when I check into the squadron, you know, I meet up with a ship in the Gulf and uh they're just like, Why are you even here? That's what my orders say. They're like, We're trying to get rid of everybody. So um it was a big hectic mess and plus being in the Gulf and, you know, all that stuff. So where I'm learning my ways, I'm learning what to do, but every time there's nobody there, there's like half the people from the squadron have already moved to different squadrons. So they come to me and they're like, hey, great news. We got you orders, a new, a new command. I'm like, okay, cool. And they're like, Miramar. What? And they're like, yeah, there's a, and I knew who it was when I was at Miramar during my training. There was a girl there who was doing like desk work and she was pregnant. So I guess uh, she was getting ahead of her baby. So they needed to replace her with somebody else to do desk work, which would have been shore duty, which in the military, shore duty is like in the Navy. That's you're stuck on shore. You don't have to go out on ships for six months. So that's just the best, best job, unless you like the ships and doing all that stuff. So like, yeah, you're lucky you're going to Miramar. You get to go back there and, you know, that's right. California, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, no. No, I don't. I don't want to go to Miramar. Miramar. I joined the Navy to come to Japan, and my the, I want to say it was a chief or first class, whatever he was. My boss was like, "Are you crazy? You're turning down shore duty for your first command, your first tour." He's like, "You will never have to ride a ship if you don't want. I mean, you 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 can do three years there and then just get out or whatever." I was like, "No, sir. With all due to respect." I want to stay in Japan, so is there anything we can do? And he was like, well, we can talk to the CEO, see what see what the CEO says. So now, besides being the idiot who told so-and-so to go join the military, now I'm the idiot that's turning down shore duty, my first you know, first command, my first tour in the Navy. So now I'm even a bigger idiot, and people are just like, are you stupid? You're dumb. You know, what are you doing? Blah, blah, blah. So it gets worse, trust me. So I go see the CEO, and like I said, I've been in the Navy under six months. I mean, I just got out of Miramar, which was easy. It's just all friends. Now I'm talking with CEOs and stuff. I don't know how to do this, what I got to say, who, you know, it's just, I was driving. I was just nervous wreck. Plus I might be going back after I just got here. You know, my whole purpose of joining the military was to come to Japan. So I go see the CEO and the CEO is like, uh, I hear there's a problem with your orders, you know, blah, blah, blah. Let me make, let me understand this right. You, you're, you don't want to go back to Miramar and do shore duty. You, you want to stay in Japan, this country. And I was like, yes, sir. I'll do whatever it takes. I'll go wherever I need to go. Just, I don't want to leave. And he's like, I, I don't know what your purpose is or what you, you know, what, what, you know, what you're trying to do. But if you really want to stay in Japan, the, uh, the independence, which was the carrier that we were stationed on, can always use people. So if you're willing, you know, we'll, uh, I'll call them and see if you know they'll take you. And I'm like, yes, do it, of course. You know, he's like, are you sure? And he asked me, I think like five times, are you sure you want to take the a ship, the USS Independence, over Miramar? I'm like, sir, yes, 100% hands down. This is what I want. I joined the Navy to be in Japan. Please, you know, help me on this one. So he made some calls. I go back up and see my boss, and he's like, all right. You're going to the independence. Now, besides being the guy who told so-and-so to join the military, besides the guy turning down the uh, shore duty in Miramar, now I'm the idiot that's going to chose the independence, which everybody just, I mean, I was called every name. I mean, these guys just hated me. I was just like the biggest idiot. But, hey, this is what I wanted. So I, I get my stuff. I grab my bags and jump on the train. I go down to... Yokosuka, you know, it's about a 45 minute train ride from Atsugi. I go to the gate, get in, go to the ship. I go check into the, uh, the admin department, whatever it's called. I don't, I don't remember. It's been a while. So I go check in. 
And so the, the guy who's checking me in, he's, he's an older guy. I mean, he's probably got to be close to his retirement first class, I think. And he's like, oh, my God, you're from uh, BF-21 Black Knights. Or something. I don't remember the, the squadron that I was with. I was only with them for like five days. But he was like, oh, my God, you're with BF-51, 21, whatever it was. That was my very first squadron when I joined the military. I started with them, too. And we, he just laughed about it. And he's like, wow, you know, this is so I was like. Yeah, I was only there for a few days. He's like, yeah, I heard they're decommissioning. I wanted to get a, a, a patch or something, but I had some because, you know, I, some memorabilia that I took from them. So I opened my bag. I was like, here you go. You know, there you go. So this guy is so happy. And he was a really nice guy. So he's like, well, usually I would send you to the, like the, the kitchen or, you know, the hydraulics part of the ship or the, the plumbers. He said, but I'll tell you what, where do you want to go? So see, that was the first the first sign that if you're nice to somebody, you know, you never know what's going to happen. I mean, that's because I gave him that, that patch or whatever thing I had, like whatever it was I had, you know, he was like, well, where do you want to go? And I was like, well, originally I wanted to do weapons and police and that kind of job. But they told me that, you know, that's not an option. And he was like, really? Why, why not? I was like, I don't know. He's like, we have a weapons department. Do you want to go to weapons? I was like, yes. You know, I mean, I love, I'm from Missouri. So, you know, we love guns and stuff. It's in our blood. So he was like, well, let me make some calls. So he calls like uh, G G4, one of the other G division. G's are basically, just think of it as guns, like weapons. So G1, I think he called G1 first. Uh, they answered, but, you know, the guy was like, well, we're busy right now. I'll call you back kind of thing. So they called G2. G2 didn't answer. Called G3. G3 or G4, one of them didn't need anybody or they only needed AOs, people that were, you know, qualified to be with weapons because I'm still a non-designate. I'm just a nobody. I got to learn from the start. And then I think G5, I mean, the line was busy, I think. So he called G2 back and somebody in G2 answered. And they were like, well, yeah, we can definitely use them because uh, I guess just like well, maybe a week before I got there, somebody had fired a gun in the armory, like by mistake, it just went off into the wall. And uh, it was a big mess. People were getting transferred. People were in trouble because letting something stupid like that happen. So they're like, yeah, we'll take him. Just So I go up to G2, and I meet with the, the gunner. Unique guy. He was like, so, you know, why do you want to be here? And I was just like, sir, I love guns. I love weapons. And, you know, he's like, you know, what do you think? I, said, I just told him what anybody would say. I'll do my best. And he was like, all right, you know, you know, grab a bunk. You know, we'll get you settled in and start tomorrow. But at the time, there wasn't bunks, any bunks open, so I had to go to a temporary berthing. I remember that. I went to a temporary berthing until they could get me something open. And while I was in Miramar, before I left, I bought a brand new guest watch. I mean, it was probably about $150, but for me, that was a Rolex. So I go into the guest, uh, the temporary berthing, and I go to take a shower and stuff. Then leave because you know, I'm going back to Yokohama because I, I was staying with my girlfriend at the time, which I had met in high school. She was my high school girlfriend and stuff, so... I uh, put everything on my rack. I go take a shower and come back. The watch is gone. There's only like three people in that birthing, but the watch is gone. Of course, I asked them, but, you know, they were like, I don't know. I don't know. And funny story, like uh, maybe two years later doing a working party where you're unloading and offloading uh, like stuff. You, you have to bring in all the vegetables and the food before we go on a big cruise. The guy next to me had my watch on, and it was the same guy in my temporary birthing. Uh, that was another story, but, you know, two years later, I found my watch. Just just so you know, and yeah, because I still had the pieces for the, the band that I, I fixed, you know, to measure it for my wrist and stuff, so I got my watch back, maybe a year and a half later. What's the luck of that? 5,000 people on a ship, we're doing a working party, and the guy next to me has my watch on. Just dumb luck. So anyway, uh, my watch gets stolen, and I'm mad, and I'm asking these guys, and they're just like, you know, shut up, you know, rookie, you know, we don't know, somebody, you know, you don't leave your stuff out on your rack, which is, you know, a rule. So, I check into G2, and uh, it's exactly what I wanted. It's, it's small arms. It's all, you know, guns, and, and it's not the whole missiles, and well, it was a little bit, but we didn't have to work with, like, torpedoes or anything. Well, we did have torpedo people, too, but it wasn't, like, putting bombs on planes or anything like that. It was actually security force, which that's exactly what I wanted, and, and, and I loved it. And I remember I checked in with, there was a doll and Bailey. 
Dahl was from like I think uh, like Montana up in the mountains. I mean, he used to hunt in the winter for food. And Bailey was from Mississippi, and totally just just black and white. These guys were the totally opposite of each other. And literally, Bailey was black, and Dahl was a white country, and they were best friends. And these two guys, Dahl couldn't understand what Bailey was saying half the time, and then Dahl took talk with such a southern accent we couldn't understand what he was saying half the time but these guys were just best friends it was the coolest friendship you could ever see i mean i remember doll came up to me he's like yo you know bachi why is bailey mad at me i'm like oh why what'd he say he goes he keeps calling me a dog and i don't know what that why he would do that you know did i make him mad i was like no man you know he's just saying dog like his boy his bro He's like, that's a good thing? I'm like, yes. And he's like, oh, okay. I, I mean, to us, dogs are just, you know, what we use for hunting and stuff. It was just, just funny, these two guys. But anyway, so I joined G2. Uh, had a great time. And a lot of it was because we were, you know, in the armory. We had, the, you know, security things and, you know, like you know, classified weapons. And we had, we had to take care of the uh, sprinklers for the, uh, the magazines that held all the missiles and the weapons and stuff. So, not really much I can talk about with that. We just took care of guns. I mean, now I do remember one time they uh, had a SEAL team come on board. Because whenever the SEAL teams come on, on board, I might get in trouble for this now. I hope the SEAL teams come on board, you know, they have to check in with us. Because we're the only people on the ship allowed to carry weapons. And um, so they checked in with us. And uh, we put all the weapons into a, a case. And we seal it with like a, a metal serial numbered seal thing so you know there's only one so if, if it's cut or the number is a different number when they come back check it means their box was opened it's our job to make sure that their stuff is taken care of because they'll come to a carrier and the carrier will transport them somewhere they're not cruise wherever we're going and then they'll jump off and meet up with the submarine and go into and remember this is during the war this is during iraq so you could never tell them i was excited it was my first time to meet a a, a seal team you know because i wanted to be a seal everybody wants to be a seal when you join the navy and uh so i'm waiting in the army and the way the armory works is you can only open the door from the inside so it can't open up from the outside so somebody has to lift a lev lever and let you in so i'm waiting there and i get to knock on the door and you know i open it up i slide the little thing i'm like can i help you and this i don't know he's probably five my, my height five seven five eight maybe maybe a little shorter five six anyway just skinny blonde dude and he was like yo dude I'm here to check in. I'm like, uh, really? He's like, yeah, SEAL team, whatever, six, seven, eight, whatever it was. Team seven, checking in, man. The rest of you guys are on the way. So I'm like, whoa, not, not what I expected. So open the door, he comes in, check his ID, all that stuff. You know, it's clear. So he's, he's unloading his weapons. He's like, man, can't wait to get to Australia, hit some waves before we go on mission, man, dude. Just total surfer, just total California surfer. But it makes sense. I mean, he probably grew up in the water and can swim. You know, that's most of what SEALs do is their lives are on the water. So so he checks in, and then uh, a couple other guys come, and they check in their guns. And the, the, the surfer guy, he was cool. So he stayed around. We were talking, you know. And, and uh, so his his lieutenant, I think his lieutenant, comes in and gives me his, his weapons, you know, MP5, stuff like that. And we're checking them in. And as he's bending over doing something, I can notice in his back, he's got, a gun. I think it's a. I thought, I thought it was a Desert Eagle. It was a huge, huge handle. So you know, I'm like, sir, um, I, I need all your weapons. He's like, you you have them all. I was like, uh, yes, sir. Uh, uh, no disrespect, but I I have to collect all your weapons. It's just policy. You know, it's a, you know, it's a system. It's a military. You know, rules are rules. So he looks at me. He's like, you know. I think at the time I might have been a four, maybe petty officer. I don't know, maybe an E3. I don't even think I was a petty officer at the time. He was like, you know, so what did he say? He said something like, you know, you have all my weapons. I don't think I need to repeat myself again. So I'm like, what do I do? And this is a lieutenant. I'm a note, and I'm still like, not even, I'm not even a gunner yet because I didn't even take the test. So yeah, I was an E3, I think, at the time. I, I still haven't got my stripes yet. I'm, so. I think, what do you call semen? He's like semen or whatever. You know, you know. I give you all my weapons. So I look behind the surfer dude's behind him saying. So I look at this, the surfer guy and I look back at him. I was like, all right, lieutenant. You know, I, I I hear you and thank you very much. Just sign right here and 
you can go to your birthing and and relax. And he was like, thank you. He signs and he leaves. And the surfer guy, and he's like, oh, Yo, you know, I know you saw the gun. It, it popped out of the back of the, you know, nobody touches. I think he said Bertha or Selma or Thelma or whatever his name is. He's like, nobody touches Bertha. That's his personal, you know, that's his, it stays on him at all times. And I was like, yeah, but you know, if he gets caught, I'm gonna get to it. He's like, he's never gonna leave the birthing. He's gonna be in there and he's just gonna take a nap, sleep. And then we, we, we fly out at like three in the morning, the helicopter's taking us to our next, you know, pickup. So he's like, don't even, don't even worry about it. And I was like, yeah, easy for you to say. But, you know, I was sweating bullets because, you know, I'm, I don't want to get put in the brig for the breaking the rules. So the next morning, I wasn't in the army. The guys come in, they collected their weapons and they left, you know. Oh, I took the surfer guy to, uh, to to lunch down in, before they you know before at dinner I guess it was so in the military you have all your, your your cafeteria it's like a school and everybody takes their sections you got your groups of people so, you know the, the nerds and the, the the jocks and you know just like that so we sit down and next to us is the uh, the magic gathering people I don't want to say nerds I mean I'm a nerd too but I never got into magic so the magic is a board game and these guys would play this like from the time they get off to the time they got to check in the next morning, they just sit there and play this card game. So we're sitting there and the seal, now they, 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 they look like us, they don't, but they have the trident right here. So the kid, it's a surfer kid. He looks over to this guy next to him and he's like, no, dude, do you have the dragon slayer 37? The guy's like, no, I've been trying to get it, but I've done quest the Baltimore's quest or whatever, you know, just, they're just talking this magic stuff. And I'm just like, Oh my God. He's like, yeah, I finally got the Dragon Slayer 36. I was doing the, the quest to Belzimar and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And these nerds and stuff, they're just like, oh my God, you know. And he's like, yeah, it can kill or whatever with one, with a dice roll of 13 or whatever they're talking about. And I'm just like, just listening to him, just laughing. And then the, the, the magic kid, you know, big glasses, he looks over and he sees his trident. He's like, oh my God, you're, you're a Navy SEAL. And he was like, yeah. And he was like, oh. So they just started going off. And, he, and all of this group of magic slayer kids just freaked out. They just went, you know, he's a seal. And they were asking. He's like, I can't talk about that. I can't really say it. You know, it's all classified. I'm sorry. And in the time, if we had internet, they would have definitely changed uh, line IDs or whatever it was just to keep in contact talking about that dragon slayer sword or whatever it was. But it, it was funny. So after that, we went back to the birthing. They checked out. They flew out in the morning. But I went down and the gunner called me in. And the gunner, you know, I went down there and the gunner was like, um, I got a letter from the uh, the lieutenant about you. And I'm just like, oh my God, I'm done. I'm like, I'm fired. I don't know if the Navy fires people, but we'll find out. And he was like, it was a letter of recommendation. He said, you did a very good job. You were very well, you, very, you handled yourself very well. You were very, you know, blah, blah, blah. You, you followed rules to the T. And he just a great letter of recommendation. And because of that, at the time, E3s couldn't be armors, but I think I was standing in for somebody because they had to go to eat or something, so I was just there when the SEAL team came up, and plus the, so somebody else was up there. So at the time, E3s couldn't be gunners or get qualified to be a gunner, or whatever the rule was, or E2. But the gunner, the boss, we call him the gunner, and the gunner means duty, gunner means the armory checker. You have your guy in the front that checks keys and stuff, and that's, like a, that's I forget what we call him, gunner's mate. And the guy in the back who takes care of the army is an armor. So he was like, the gunner boss was like, you know, you do, I know you've been trying to be an armor. That's what it is, an armor. I know you've been trying to be an armor for a while, but because you're not, you know, rank, your, your rate is so low that couldn't. He goes, I'll tell you what, if you get all the quals done, I'll let it slide. I'll give you the, the armor title, which just means I don't have to check out, do all this desk work. I can sit in the back and just clean guns and basically chill. So I got my stuff called and I became an armor. I think, I think he told me, I think my, it could be a lie. It could be because you know, people switch out division. But he's like, I was the youngest or the lowest break person to ever become an armor in the division. This is what he said, but we'll see. I think I was E2 when I became an armor. And that was my, my Navy SEAL experiment. It was, it was interesting, but he wasn't going to give up that gun for no, no way whatsoever. Was he going to give me that gun? But yet again, I was nice and uh, 
broke the rules a little bit and I got a letter of recommendation which advanced me into what I wanted. So, well, that's that story. So, like the military stories, I, I'm not much to say. I mean, not much I can say. It was, I'll stop that one there and I'll think of something else and come back. Peace.